So hi, everybody. Welcome to the Board Pro Governance Made, uh, Made Easy webinar titled today, Board Skills Matrix, How to Get It Right. My name's Sean McDonald, and I'll be your moderator for the next 40 odd minutes. And firstly, thanks for attending today. We appreciate the effort you've made to be here for our live event. During the session, if you have any questions, please use the uh, Q&A button at the bottom of your screen or on your toolbar, wherever that is. And we'll be answering these during our session and try to get through as many of your questions as we have time for. And finally, if you stay through till the end, which of course we hope you will do, and as is customary for our webinars, we have a special treat for you. By answering our really short one minute survey at the end of the webinar, you'll go into the draw to win our beautiful gift hamper, worth over $400. Now, for those of you not too familiar with Board Pro, we're a board software provider, sometimes called a board portal, that serve just over 25,000 users around the world. And we enable organizations to prepare for and run their board meetings more efficiently and effectively with clever software and less time and deliver more impact and value for the organization. And as much as we are a board software provider, part of our wider mission is to make the fundamentals of governance free and easy to implement for all organizations, especially those with resource constraints. And how we do this is in part through these webinars, along with the many guides, templates, uh, and white papers on our website. You'll find all of this information, uh, all of the many uh, guides, white papers, and business templates on our resource center. So feel free to jump over there after the webinar and have a little look. Now, I normally make the introductions, but today I am going to pass over to our team to introduce themselves, starting with uh, Nick Barnett. Over to you, Nick. Hey, thanks, Sean, and thanks for all these uh, the great work you do with these webinars. My name's uh, Nick Barnett, or Nicholas Nick Barnett. I'm the executive chairman of both InSync and Board Benchmarking. Spend my, most of my life in boards, um, done about 250 plus board reviews and look forward to today. Thank you. Fantastic. Steve, over to you. Hi, everyone. Steve Bowman here from Conscious Governance. Uh, I've been in the governance space for <laughs> quite some 40 years. Um, so I've seen some amazing things, dealt with some of the most amazing people in governance, and then there's the other side of the, the coin as well. So I look forward to sharing some of our insights and our experiences today. Thank you. Fantastic. I only just realised I wasn't sharing my screen. That's <laughs> cool. Over to you, Susan, Dr. Susan right. Moran. Thank you, Sean, and, and uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Susan Ravlick. I'm a colleague of, uh, of Nick Barnett's, and I work closely with Nick um, uh, at InSync, uh, and I am a principal consultant. So I've been uh, working in boards for, for a, a few years now, and uh, my experience is deep within um board dynamics specifically and um, and uh, looking at uh, the cultural impacts um, of those on how a board functions. Fantastic. Thank you, team. Right, let me just flick over to the presentation. Over to you, Nick. Thank you very much, Sean. And again, thanks for doing all these webinars. I know that um, you had more than six or 700 people register to, to join this. It's a, that's an impressive number of people that love your webinar, so thank you. Um, so let's start with talking about, well, what is a board skills matrix? And most of us on this webinar probably have seen the grey bit on the left where we put the director's name and along the top we put the skills and experiences down the side and we fill it in. And we fill it in on a, with a scale of one, two, three, or one, two, three, four, or different scales to denote what are we feeling about the skills of each person. Often it's done as a self-assessment, and we're going to talk more about that. Sometimes it's a self and a peer assessment. We'll talk more about that as well. But there's a sense of, okay, where, where are the skills? Who's got them? And how does that play out across the whole group? 
Um, so there's a lot of stuff going on here. I'm just going to actually, I might throw it to Susan and I might throw it to, um, to Stephen and say, what do you see when you see this board skills matrix? Is there anything jumping out at you? Any questions that are going through your mind? Mm -hmm. I've got heaps I can throw in there, but Susan, mm -hmm. what do you think? What yeah, I, I think um, that's a great intro. Um, you know, when I'm looking at particularly the way that the ratings have been assigned, uh, there's certainly some imbalances around the overall competency and the expertise on this board. And uh, Director One is a standout for me. Um, obviously, you know, when we look at the numbers of uh, twos and threes that have been rated or assigned to this director, uh, it, it shows that um, that that potentially this board might be over reliant also on this director. But I think what is potentially problematic is if this director was to leave, there would be huge uh, competency gaps or expertise gaps um, for this board. And the other point that really sort of stands out for me when I look at the way that these ratings have been ascribed. Um, is that there are two directors that uh, tend to only have uh, 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 expertise in that technology and digital business model area, and um, but across the board on the other aspects, particularly around the core functions of this business, they're quite um, low in, uh, which potentially indicates that they don't have a good understanding of this business, and and you would have an expectation that they would be a little bit more well rounded on those other competencies. And uh, for me, there's also some criticality around succession planning for this board, particularly if Director One was to leave. Um, you know, how, how does this board go about addressing um, and in balancing out those competencies? Mm, interesting. Thanks, Susan. I mean, we'll all get different things out of this. Stephen, what do you, anything jump out at you when you see this? There, look, there's two things on this skills matrix. I, I see literally thousands of them a year. And the vast majority, 95%, don't do what you've got on here. And they should. And that is, you know, how many, how many, ha, ha, what's the minimum number of directors with a two or a three? So that thinking that goes into, so what's really important to us? Do we need just access to it? Or do we need to have a large number of our directors who've got this? skill or this experience or whatever it might be. But to me, the most important bit is that very last column, the gap. That helps me as a director focus on what I think the gap is. So what it does is that I can read through all the other stuff, but let's assume that we've got a good process in place to actually identify first what the skills and experiences should be. But also, let's make it very clear what we believe the gaps are and don't leave it up to individual people to try and work that out. Mm. Yeah, Stephen, thank you. So it's interesting that you and Susan focused on different things and added mm -hmm. different perspectives. Really helpful. Uh, it's interesting that uh, in the chat and uh, in the Q and A, Frank's asked, could, sh "Should there be a total of, of uh, a total number at the bottom?" And it's really interesting, Frank. I think it, that we could easily do that, but it's interesting. Would that be really helpful? And maybe it maybe say maybe it would have identified. Susan's point that, hey, we're over relying on a particular director. Um, but I, I guess it also, I'd be careful with the total uh, score because skills matrices and skills are about, you know, how do we get the board working and how do we get the right composition so that overall we've got the right skills? And it's about overall. It's not about every director having being the best at everything on this list because that never happens. Mm. Um, so it's about what's Director 1 contributing, what's Director 2 contributing, what's Director 3 contributing. And interestingly, Susan points out Director 3, really good, probably recruited to this board because they've got the technology and digital skills, and that happens a lot on boards. Um, Susan interestingly pointed out, but hold on, they... It, that director three has got a, a one, doesn't really know much about the core business. Um, so that's that's a really interesting thing. So there's a lot going on here. I, I love talking about the core business um, and that is so fundamental uh, in a board skills matrix. And 
Um, Stephen, you've seen hundreds of them. I've seen lots of them too, whether it's hundreds, but I've actually seen skills matrices that don't have the core business of the organisation on the list. I actually yeah. saw one where there were 24 skills, and we'll talk about whether there should be 24, 36, or more like 10. Um, you've got to have the core business there. But I did see one that's a reasonable size organisation that didn't have the core business on the list. Uh, we're, getting some, we're getting some great questions coming through, Nicholas. Can we, can we have a look at some of those? One of them there is from Sue saying, do you find that self-assessors are more conservative than peer assessors? <laughs> uh, which, which gets to the heart of a whole lot of issues that people have with skills matrices. Do you want to address that? Yeah, I think we should, and you're going to, actually. <laughs> Why don't you address that one? Well, I mean, in, in here, self-assessment is, uh, is, is, is useful, but at the same time, what some boards are starting to do is that they're looking at the self-assessment and then they pass it through their nominations committee to make sure the nominations committee actually agree with it. And, and the, the issue often is that people tend to either self-assess themselves way too low or way too high. Mm -hmm. And um, particularly in some professions, there are some people in certain professions where they will never rate themselves as less than a five because that's the way they've been brought up in that profession to always be the very best at what they're doing. So mm -hmm. some sort of independent review of that. The, the, the worst way of doing it, I've found from very painful experience, is if they ask someone independent to fill out what the uh, the skills are. So I think uh, probably um, I've, I've seen the, the boards that do this the best actually uh, have a mix of those. Susan? Yeah, us, yes, yeah, absolutely. I, I was, sorry, just got a little uh, focused on, on uh, one of the other questions there, which I might sort of lead into that if I can, um, around uh, how diversity is also incorporated uh, into the skills matrix, particularly around gender, culture, et cetera. Um, so, Nick, you know, how, from your experience, how, how, is that, how is that sort of applied in, in best practice scenarios? Yeah, look, look, that's a good one. And the other thing that's not on here and we'll talk about is, is attributes and behaviours, and we'll come to that in a slide in, uh, in, in a little bit. But most, um, most boards that, that do this well actually have a statement around their de desired diversity criteria. It's, sometimes they'll put it actually on the matrix, but it'll often be a statement, and sometimes it's... It's about representative in different states in terms of so federated groups want one from each state. Not that that's great diversity, but it, at least it gives you a bit of a sense. Most of these days we'll talk about gender diversity and the need for gender. More and more um, organisations are thinking about ethnicity and they're also thinking about age, um, but they're also thinking about all of that in terms of well, what are the different cognitive skills and abilities that we need and diversity, um, lived, lived, different lived experience and all those things. So that if it's well embedded in an organisation, if diversity is well embedded and well thought about, it's all part of the, part of the culture and DNA of an organisation. Um, we might just go back to the slide, the same slide, Sean, if we can. The, the other thing I might say here too for everyone on here, what, what Nick's showing you, you know, what is a board skills matrix, that's not the template to use. It's to get us thinking about things. So each board will develop up something slightly different. What we'll be doing is taking you through some of the key elements, some of the key issues. And one of the key issues is, well, who should actually score them? And, you know, do we have uh, you know, ultimate scores and, you know, is, do, do we want to you know, focus on the ones that most directors should have? Um, so we'll cover those as we go through it all. But this is not the the, the penultimate uh, uh, skills matrix. It's just to get us thinking about what some of the key issues are. Yeah. And it's the form, I think it's fair to say, that 95% of boards use. Yep. Um, and and, and I, Nico, I was just also going to highlight too, because this is sort of coming through on some of the questions, is the importance about having rigorous processes 
uh, in the assessment uh, of coming up with those uh, ratings, particularly about ensuring that there is impartiality and there is a balanced view um, in how those ratings are, are quantified and qualified. Yeah. Let, let's cover that because, and Stephen, you've covered that a little bit as well, but look, in my experience, um, most use a self-rating and they put the numbers in and it goes no further. And often that is because it's more of a desktop thing, a compliance thing that people do to say, yes, we've got a skills matrix. Mm -hmm. I think the organisations that do it really well, and, and Stephen's talked about it, it actually, it's, it's overseen by a committee, maybe a nominations and governance committee. Um, others will do a peer assessment as well that will feed into this. And if there's a a significant difference in the peer and self-assessment, there'll be a bit of rigour applied. Well, hold on, how can you say you're a three? Um, I also, for the bigger organisations, will often do, and Stephen, you've probably done the same, or Susan, um, do a workshop with the board and put it all on, put this on a whiteboard and mm -hmm. say to each other, now, do you really think you're a three on that? Or you're not a two, you're definitely a three on that. And that adds a bit of rigour. And it's really interesting to look at the scaling. So we've got familiar, competent, experienced, expert, specialist. Mm. Now, often they've got deeper uh, definitions behind expert, specialists. Hey, we've got 10 years deep experience. Competent experience means we've got at least five. Familiar means, yeah, we know about it, but we're not. We haven't got that deep five years experience. Really interesting when you start putting ESG, where it's really important for an organisation on this sort of matrix because there just aren't very many people that can ever be that are a three yet because they haven't had, you know, the, the 10 years experience. And when <laughs> I when I talk about threes, I normally say, yeah, um, you think you're a three, but would you be able to um, do a speech for an hour and would everyone come and listen? Mm -hmm. And if the answer is yes, yes, you're a specialist and an expert, but if the answer is no, we might question whether you are really a three. Steve. Nick, there's a great question that's come up here from um, Heather saying, I'm on a few boards. Uh, we have a skills matrix on one board set up as a federated structure. Oh, don't we love our federated structures? Which means we cannot control the skills of those put forward. I mean, typical of most membership organisations where a lot of the directors come from within the membership. Um, and the nomination for the board, then we try and balance equity and diversity, which pulls us away from our skills matrix. It raises a really interesting question. More and more these days, particularly membership-based organisations, what they're starting to do is to look at not just what skills we've got on the board, but how can we upskill our directors in areas where they would either be interested or that we're actually telling them they need to be upskilled in. Uh, and that upskilling isn't necessarily just a, uh, a, a course or, or um, some professional development. It could actually be experiential. So, you know, if we don't have skills in um, uh, government lobbying, for example, maybe we could start to train them. Maybe we could start to actually provide some not only professional development skills to upgrade, but also the experiences that would enable them to actually move up within that skills matrix. So one of the things that's very useful for boards to consider is to actually have a professional development policy for the mm. board that says right up front, when you come onto the board, we will sit down with you as part of your induction and look at the skills that we might want to um, support you in further developing, and we will do that. Mm. And yeah. still not many boards do that. Yeah, but it also raises the question, Stephen, about, well, how often do you do this matrix um, is it once a year and that sort of thing? Susan, have you got some thoughts on that? Because yes, it's is it a compliance thing or is it a useful thing? Yeah, it's interesting. Actually, quite a lot of boards are a bit remiss and sort of tend to only use it as a, an annual review process or uh, um, when it comes to um, just a director leaving. And, you know, by our, uh, from our experience and what best practice is, it's, a, it's actually a live tool in that it's you use it consistently all the time. So not only are you using it to assess when a director is uh, due to, to leave or there's some renewal coming up, but 
Um, you know, you should always be updating this matrix as soon as a director comes on board to make sure that you've got an accurate record of their overall experience um, and knowledge, etc. But also then looking at uh, when there is a change in strategy coming up. So continually looking about how do we future proof this board or ensure that it is fit for future um, and aligned with any strategic changes or in external environmental changes that are going to potentially impact the organisation um, to look at uh, where those gaps are. And it also talks to your point, um, Stephen, around that ongoing educational piece, um, you know, about taking into account what are the looming changes that that, that will impact the board and um, in, in the way that they need to... Uh, govern the organisation. Um, that goes to one of the other questions too, Susan, there, in that Alan said that one of the issues for some of us in, in the sector is finding directors in the first place, mm. and it's very hard. And, and you know, how do we, and then someone else has said, well, you know, how do we go out and find them and headhunt them and those sorts of things? So um, just a couple of words on that. Um, the only reason that you as a board are finding difficulty finding directors is because you haven't made yourself attractive as a board. And if you want to work your way backwards and say, well, what do we need to be to be attractive for high quality caliber people, not necessarily with experience in boards, what do we need to put in place to make this actually attractive? Well, number one, you probably want to do some sort of, you know, are you thinking of coming on our board? Have a look to see what's going to be required and do and do a community uh, update of uh, or you know, two hour session or something. What it's like to be a director on ours or any other board. You can do that as you give to the community. You can make sure you've got a very very powerful induction program that actually starts before they join the board. You can make sure that they get skills and experience that they would never be able to get anywhere else unless they are on this board. You can make all that happen, but you've got to make it happen. It just isn't okay. You're on the board. Good luck. Mm. Yeah. Nick? Um, yeah, look, we might just, and Sean's wanting to keep us moving, I think, because we've only covered one slide. So let's have a quick look at this one. Um, and this is just an example, and it's a real live one, um, where a board decided they needed 34 things to assess. Um, and there are boards out there that have, have put all those and then try and put, get everybody to assess everything. Now, if the question is, is that going to be helpful? having, you know, five, six, seven directors and 39, 34 measures, um, in my view, no. In my view, you need to have maybe eight, nine, ten at the most. Um, and But it's all about what's the most important for this board, for this organisation. It's not for someone else and it's not to grab someone else's template and say, wow, that looks pretty groovy. Let's use that because... We might have, you know, insurance, investments, legal. There might be stuff there that you, that's not that's not relevant for my board, and we'll come to that in a moment as well. Nick, I think uh, one of the things I found is this, and many boards don't do this well. The single biggest uh, input to the sort of skills you should be having around your board should come from your strategic plan. So if you've got these three or four key strategies in there, do we have the skills the or the lived experience that would actually add value to these conversations or ask questions we hadn't thought of asking? Now, mm -hmm. let's, that, let's map that over the diversity. And the mm -hmm. diversity is not just about geographic or race or, or, or um, what state you come from. It's diversity of thinking. So have we got some deep thinkers? Have we got some community-minded people? Have we got people that have got scientific background? All of those sorts of things will give us that true diversity that we're after rather than a tick-the-box sort of diversity. Another mm -hmm. an, another conversation for another time. Yeah. And I'm loving all the questions, and we've got a few there, but I, I'm just going to pick one that David's asked about. Is it common to describe the skill level in more detail? And my answer is absolutely critical. You can't just say leadership or you can't say if, if you're in one of the core business, uh, if you're in the core business, say, of real estate, you can't just say real estate because I'm great at real estate, but am I great at real estate if it's a, if it's a couple of houses and doing a bit of a reno, but would I be able to sit on a board that's um, got billion-dollar properties and 
and doing major construction and that sort of stuff. So you do absolutely need to get into the detail as to what things mean, make it relevant to uh, your organisation. And I think Stephen's point about strategy, really the skills, it's, it's this capability and skills required for the current strategic needs and just as importantly for the future strategic needs of the organisation. So they must be there, they must be clear, and depending on the size, complexity and sophistication of your board, you must describe your skills accordingly. Hope that helps. And Susan and, and Stephen, keep looking at questions. Yeah, and throwing there's, a, there's a question there from Sue Milner. Sue, I just want to address that briefly, if I can. All these things, they cost money. Where does that money come from? I think that's the wrong question. The real question is, I wonder where it is. I wonder where I can find it. It's out there. We know the money's out there. So where can we do it? Do we have to pay for it ourselves? Can we do it in conjunction with one of the universities? Can we deal with uh, some of our key stakeholders and maybe do some joint venturing with them in some of these areas? Looking at it's not in our budget is, is not a particularly good question or we don't have the money for it. The money is out there. It's just in a different space. It looks different to what we think it is. It may not even be in our bank account. But if we start looking at it from that perspective, then actually resourcing these things is not necessarily going to be just from our budget. It could be done in conjunction with others and 101 other different ways of actually creating that possibility of having the revenue and the resources to actually fund these things. Nick. Um, while you're on a roll, Stephen, do you want to cover the first couple of these about who should develop it and what are the different ways? Okay, so who, who should develop your skills matrix? I mean, typically someone has to start and it's often done through your uh, nominations and remunerations committee. But if you peel it back, it's often the company secretary that has first go at it um, or sometimes the, the chief executive. And the best way to do it, in my view, is to talk to other like organisations in your sector. If you, don't have, uh, if you don't have a skills matrix at the moment, talk to some of your other um, uh, colleagues in the sector and get a copy of theirs if they answer yes to the question that you ask them, which is, have the board found this strategically useful? Don't just get one that they use because they've got it off the internet. Mm. So who should develop your skills matrix really should be under the auspices of the governance committee or the nominations remuneration committee. And what often happens, um, in, and particularly in organisations where you've got independent directors, you often have uh, an independent chair of your nominations or your remuneration committee who is making sure that, um, that there's no uh, unseen agendas when we're, when we're actually looking at particularly the appointment of independent chairs. So who should develop them um, is, is uh, usually a committee of the board usually with support from the staff, but the board owns it. Yeah. Yeah, and it must be a living document, not a just a compliance thing that you pull out once a year, as Susan's already talked about. We might go to the next slide because <clears throat> at least 100 people prior to this webinar filled out a very short survey that assessed, one, their view of what's, the board I'm sitting on in terms of our overall board expertise, they also assessed, and how important are these 11 things to our board? Now, somebody's asked the question, are all the skills, it's Amanda, balanced and equal, or should we do some weighting? And Amanda, great question. And I think the answer is absolutely we should do some weighting. We should understand the importance and if we did, even if we assess the importance, if we've got 34 things, let's only put the most 10 important things on the list because the 34th important thing probably we don't need to know about. So you've, you uh, have all done this, and it's interesting to take the example of supply chain and logistics, was not important to most of your boards, which is not surprising. Um, we looked at the nature of your boards in some of the comments. There's a lot of sort of not-for-profits and disability, aged care, all sorts of different um, <clears throat> types of organisations. <clears throat> and supply chain and logistics absolutely shouldn't be on your list because it's not that important. But, and, but wow, governance, leadership, strategic focus, 
core business should be right up there. Um, any other reflections from this, Susan and or uh, Stephen? Oh. Uh, <clears throat> I'll just hand it. Uh, well, for me, um, in terms of, um, you know, you can see how important, um, uh, for example, uh, most most of the core competencies are um, in uh, governance, leadership, strategy. Uh, these are sort of the the I suppose the the fundamentals of of a board and um, and you know as you noted there supply chain technology don't feature as high uh, in terms of importance uh, when people were rating these elements um, on the survey. Stephen, what are your thoughts? Um. Yeah, I mean, it, it, I, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm looking at the questions that are coming through, which are really, really very interesting um, in what we're going there. Uh, the, the, one of the things that someone has said, Craig, which uh, Craig Wood has asked this really good question, how, do, how dynamic can we make the matrix documentation and process in our strategic plan? I, do we use an online doc as their tech? To me, the key gift of a matrix is the conversations that it generates, not the fact that we get a piece of paper that has has crosses on it. And in particular, when you're looking at um, what are the skills we're going to need into the future, and we need to start looking now for the people or finding out where we can get access to those people. So, for example, there's a couple of big areas that are that, are, that we're, we're staring down the barrel of that I'd really want some people with, with uh, high-level experience or skills in that area at least cons considering coming onto our board. One of them is artificial intelligence. I really want to have a look at how that's going to have an impact on what we're going. Now, I don't need a, I don't necessarily need an artificial intelligence nerd-like person, but someone who's thinking about it in their own sector, someone who's been looking at what impact this is going to have on how we deliver, how it's going to impact on our contracts, and how we can leverage it and really get uh, ahead of the game in in these areas. Uh, another a big one that. Um, I think most boards are starting to look at now is strategic stakeholder engagement. Some do this really well, but the vast majority don't. So who are our stakeholders going to be in four years or five years time that we don't even know about now? How do we make sure that we as a board are keeping our finger on the pulse of that? What sort of skills do we need around our board, our board to help us focus on these bigger picture items into the future? So to me, a skills matrix, the gift of it is the conversations that it starts, not the actual end result of the report. Yeah. Thanks, Stephen. If we just go back to the, la the other slide, I think the, the important thing is, this is overall from 100 people. The important thing is, but what about your board? Like technology uh, and digital business models may not be important for your board, but for another board, that might be a seven. That might be the most important thing because that's what the organisation's all about. It's online. Um, for another organisation, and, you know, Woolies has been in the news and coals, if you haven't got someone on, or several on the board that really understand supply chain and logistics, you are missing what it's all about for one of the, those big organisations. So it depends on... And that's the whole point. This has got to be unique to your board. Don't just grab it off the internet. And I think that's the point. Then if we go to the next slide, um, more and more we're seeing organisations saying, well, what are our values? How are they embedded? Let's Im implement those into the skills matrix. And if teamworks and collaboration is one of those, we better be high on that. But is the board living that out? Are they setting the tone at the top, et cetera? And this gives you a bit of a sense of that. And a lot of the um, uh, director effectiveness reviews that are done will, will give you an actual number on this. So that, that is an added value as well. I just sense that um, we're being pushed along. So we might go to the next slide, which talks about some of the comments. So those that did the survey, 100 odd people, they talked and gave different comments. Susan, you've read Bunch yeah, of... yeah, it's interesting to see um, the prevalence, uh, particularly when you look at that first um, column there under extra skills and experiences. And, you know, from, from uh, the volume of uh, preferences there, governance and compliance was certainly uh, 
critical on, on top of mind for most people, uh, particularly around uh, having a deeper understanding about governance and the roles or, or uh, that directors play and understanding their responsibilities around this. Uh, there was also a, a high number of, uh, of um, uh, responses around uh, directors needing to have strategic focus, strategic understanding, thinking, insight, um, and general acumen um, uh, uh, around um, uh, being more strategic and uh, also um, having a high degree of um, sector specific knowledge and industry knowledge. So understanding or having a deep understanding of the industry or the the experience within the industry of where the um, the organization is operating in or the board and the board um, ensures mirrors that. Um, and then looking at the other um, areas, what, what came out in the open comments, um, once again, just touching, and this came out on the other slide that you had uh, around behaviours, but uh, integrity was, a, a, well, actually commitment was the number one desired attribute that, that most people thought was absolutely critical. And we agree, you know, directors need to be committed. And it comes out often when we're reviewing boards uh, where there are criticisms where, you know, directors come onto a board but aren't um, actually spending the time, dedicating the time that's required uh, to do the work. Uh, and um, uh, the other desired uh, attributes was around um, the directors having the ability to engage in conversation, to challenge, um, to be able to be... Um, uh, quite analytical in the way of the, their, their thinking and um, uh, also having deep listening skills and an openness to, to explore new ideas, to be constructive also in the, in the way that they're challenging each other and the conversations that they have. And then in that third column, what sort of stood out uh, was around diversity was uh, once again, there was a high number of uh, responses around uh, the need for professional and industry experience and uh, directors having the relevant professional background um, at, uh, in the sector that the, the, um, the organisation is operating in. Um, the other uh, high um, number of responses was around gender um, and also um, around having that gender balance that's still top of mind and uh, there are a huge number of responses around that. And uh, age diversity, so ensuring that there was a good cross-representation of various age groups, but also a strong desire to have more younger people on the board. So obviously there's some thinking that we we still don't, we, don't, we haven't got that, uh, that age uh, factor quite right um, and and getting that a little bit more balanced. There, there's some, some of the key key things that came through as far as the key themes. Yeah, there, there's an interesting question from Jenny um, and that's around uh, the, the, the areas of diversity. How do you measure it or don't you? Uh, is a statement of intent. Now, look, the, the thing behind diversity is the reason you want diversity is you want different ways of viewing the world sitting around your board table. You don't want them to represent the sector. It's not about representation. We've got to get that out of our heads. So you don't have someone who represents the Indigenous uh, uh, sector. You don't have someone who represents the disability sector or whatever it might not. No, if you're, you're looking for the lived experience that will then shape the questions and the insights that that director brings to the board. And um, often what we find is that the notion of diversity gets a little bit sidetracked because we, we're, we're ticking the box about we need to have, you know, um, uh, male and female and, a, and an equal. No, no, what you need is you need the different experiences that that brings to the table. That's really what we're after. So a conversation, a conversation around diversity shouldn't be focused on the tick the box approach. It should be here's the mindsets, the lived experiences, the 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 the, the things that these people have been through, through either the technical or the personal or whatever it might be, that will shape their view of the world, that will enable us as a board to see things from a much broader context 
then we're if all from the same um, background and whatever it might be. So and that's, that's a really critical point that you raised, Stephen, because you know it's all too easy for boards to get trapped into homogenous thinking by having the their you know everyone's the same or coming from a, a same background, um, and you know. More and more, uh, we're needing to ensure that those alternative lenses or perspectives can be brought to the table to stretch the thinking, to be able to be far more forward thinking um, in being able to challenge the views and to bring those um, alternative uh, processes or thinking processes into the conversations. Yeah, and look, there's some very clever ways of doing this as well, too. One of them, um, very large, very well-known nonprofit organisation, one of their directors, they have specifically gone out and sought, who is the uh, chief executive of a multicultural organisation representing all sorts of cultures. And they themselves come from a different background than any of the other directors that come from a medical profession. And they, uh, I know because I interviewed them all, um, they so appreciate his different point of view about things, but he's not trying to represent multicultural. He is multicultural, (laughs) but he gets access to a whole lot of other points of view as well too. So so there's different ways that you can look to see how you can get access to these skills, experiences, uh, lived experiences. Many organisations have a, a consumer advisory committee, for example, that feeds through usually to the, 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 the operations of the organisation. But in amongst there, there might be some really, really smart people who just because of who they are could really add value to the discussions around the board table because they're insightful. They're willing to be brave. They're willing to make their comments uh, heard. They're willing to um, be humble at the same time. These are all the soft skills that you, you won't know until you get to know some of these people. And often you find it through the committee structure you've already got in place. They are a great grounds for identifying potential diversity skills and experience because they're sitting on these committees and you get to know them before they actually join the board. Nick. Yeah, thanks, Stephen. Look, that diversity thing, and I think one of the part of the question was, and how do you measure it? Um, there aren't really great measurement tools, but the best tool you've got is, number one, to live and breathe diversity, but live and breathe it because it does make a massive difference and it does improve innovation, it lifts productivity, it lifts performance. You've all hopefully understood that research and you are on board because of it. And if you're just driving that diversity discussion at the board, it'll help make sure it's driven right through the organisation. Um, no, we, we've got we've only got a minute or so left, Nicholas. Do you want to summarise and and um, just lead us through to that last couple of minutes? Yeah. So look, we've got do's and don'ts. You can read them. You'll all be getting the slide pack. But I've loved the discussion. Thanks for all the uh, involvement from everybody. And um, we are going to make sure, by the way, everybody not get only gets these slides, but for those that did the uh, survey, we're going to give you a, and and everyone else who's attending this webinar, we'll make sure you'll get a copy of that feedback that came. So you'll be reading your own stuff amongst, with other contributions. So hopefully that will help as well. I think also, Nick, due to the weight of the questions that we've had through, we've got about a dozen questions there stacked up. We'll take these offline and respond to them uh, in a follow-up email, if you wouldn't mind. Yeah, sure. Love. That would be great. Fantastic. Thank you. You'll make sure you send those to us, Sean. We'll make sure we give you answers. Fantastic. Thank you very much. All right. So that brings us to the end. I wish we had more time, but uh, time goes fast when there's a great topic. So thanks, Nick, Steve, and Susan, for your contribution today. Um, Please feel free to reach out to uh, our team on LinkedIn. I draw your attention to the next webinar coming up on our curriculum, which is how to run and manage board committees, which will be a really great topic with Margot Foster. We also have a fantastic masterclass coming up on how to write better board papers, which is always a great topic. As you um, as you leave the webinar, don't forget to complete the short survey and go into the draw for our gift hamper. We'll announce the winner 
tomorrow, actually. We'll announce that winner. Thanks again for attending, everybody. I hope you enjoyed the session. Sorry we didn't get through all the questions. We look forward to seeing you again in our next webinar. Thanks again, everybody. Have a great day.